Uh, good morning. My name is Richard Schiffer. I'm the chairman of ADR Group. Mike Lind was going to uh, in make the introduction this morning, but I asked him if I could do it instead. He graciously agreed. The reason why I wanted to make this introduction was that I was at the first two conferences of the ODR Group in Geneva uh, five years ago with Graham, Graham Ross. And I wanted to put the developments of this organization and this conference in context. I mean, it's quite amazing. We have more than 120 people here for these two days. Uh, that's probably double the size it was five years ago. We have people from 29 countries, which again is probably double the number of countries. We have a much broader range of professions. I think in Geneva it was half people from the UN and a few people with technical interests in the subject. Now we've got lawyers, we've got much broader range of professions involved. We have people that are just talking about core systems in various countries, which is a new development. Yesterday we even had a presentation about psychology and dispute involvement. And this has evolved now into a second level when we're talking about values and we're talking about concerns and social concerns, which is a completely new area for ODR to get into. And yesterday, uh, Colin Rule proposed what I want to call the uh, Liverpool Manifesto, and I hope that that uh, gets developed a little bit more today and that something comes out of this conference. Uh, in Geneva, Graham and I were sponsoring a drinks, and I'm very pleased that we've been able to sponsor a much bigger event this time. And we want you to know that we'll be in Hong Kong, we'll be in Vancouver, and I hope that all the other commercial organizations that are participating in this continue to support this effort with uh, money and support, because it's very important for everybody. Uh, yesterday, there were a few what I thought were rather lame references to Beatles songs. I mean, there was Hard Day's Night, there was Help, there was, I think, uh, Imagine. But I think you missed the best one. Talk about your resolution. Well, you know. So <laughs> I wanted to get mine in. Uh, the purpose of my standing here as well, to put this context, is to introduce the spe keynote speaker of this morning, uh, Professor Richard Susskind. I saw him speak about 15 years ago in London at a conference. I don't really remember much about the conference, but I remember him as being a terrific speaker. And I congratulate you, Graham, for organizing to get him to come here today. He's probably, well, he's an educator, he's a solicitor, he's a journalist, he's an author, he's a futurologist, he writes a lot about what the legal profession is going to be in the future. Uh, he's um, gov and the advisor, IT advisor to the, uh, the Lord uh, Chief Justice. And he's, as a Scot, he may be in the next, uh, very in, in crowd in the next uh, UK government. So he's a terrific speaker, and I welcome you all, and you're very lucky to hear him today. Thank you very much for that introduction. Good morning to you all. Uh, fascinating, actually. ODR has uh, intrigued me for a number of years. And in preparing what I, uh, I'm going to say today, uh, in many ways, the lessons I wanted to, to, to put forward uh, have mirrored many of the lessons I've talked about in emerging technologies over the years. So in a sense, I could have given the same talk 10 or 15 years ago. So you may in fact be hearing the same talk that I gave 10 or 15 years ago. What I'm conscious of is that you're all specialists, or many of you are specialists in ODR, and I'm not. I, I'm a, it's such a, there's such a, a kind of a generalist in the world of legal technology. And it's always a little bit inhibiting and daunting speaking to a group uh, about their specialist subject when you're not a specialist yourself. And it reminds me of my favorite story in life about the, the great scientist Albert Einstein. And apparently Albert Einstein, many years ago, when he was giving a lecture tour in England, got very friendly with the chauffeur who used to drive him to and from the lecture theaters at which he was speaking. And one day, 
Einstein is on the way to this conference, he's sitting in the car, and the chauffeur's in the front driving, and Einstein's sitting in the back, and the chauffeur says, Professor Einstein, you, you really are a remarkable man, I hope you don't mind me saying this to you, but what I find amazing is not simply the sophistication of your theories, it's your ability to break down these theories into simple, straightforward propositions that even a fool that I, like I can understand, that's what I find amazing. Uh, and Einstein simply by said, it was very kind of you to say so. And the chauffeur continues, he said, in fact, so clear are your presentations, and so many times have I heard them, that I think I myself could give one of your presentations. And Einstein said, well, it's interesting you should say that, because I'm getting rather bored of giving the same talk again and again. Why don't we try an experiment? Just before we arrive at a lecture theatre, why don't we reverse roles? I'll climb out of my clothes and get into your chauffeur's uniform, I'll stand at the back of the hall, as you would normally do, and you can get into my clothes and stand at the front and give the talk. What do you think? The chauffeur thinks this is a marvelous idea. So they, they duly arrive at the lecture theatre, and Einstein, as promised, gets out of his clothes, gets into the chauffeur's uniform, stands at the, the back of the hall, as the chauffeur would normally have done, and the chauffeur in Einstein's clothes at the front gives this presentation, and it's magnificent, and the crowds were going wild. But what they hadn't banked on, of course, was question time. And this, this very eminent physicist stands up and asks this impossibly difficult question. The chauffeur's eyes glaze over. He says, that question is so easy, I'm going to ask my chauffeur at the back of the hall. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, any difficult questions, and I'll, I'll throw them back to the, the chauffeurs amongst you. I want to do four things today, and it's all about putting ODR in a more general context, and I hope that's helpful for you. I want to say something about technology, emerging technologies, and how exciting uh, things are in the world of IT more generally. I want to talk about the evolution of legal service. I've been working over the last couple of years in a model that tries to describe, and it's related to technology, but it's not exclusively related to technology, the way in which legal service is evolving. And I haven't completed my thinking this. What I'm trying to do is map ODR onto that model, and I'd welcome your thoughts on that. Penultimately, I want to say, what's the UK government doing? What's happening in this country? And then offer some, some thoughts on the future. But where I want to start, and this is, I, it, 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 I have used this slide for many, many years, and it applies so well to this area, is a story about Black & Decker, the world's leading manufacturer of power tools. Now, it's said that Black & Decker, when they recruit new people, they take their, particularly senior executives, they take them off in a course. And they sit these new executives down in a conference room, and they put up a first slide, and it's a slide much like the slide you see before you, of a gleaming power tool. And they say to the new executives, these people who are part of Black & Decker, they say, this is what we sell, isn't it? And the executives all are rather surprised by this. They say, of course that's what we sell, we're Black & Decker. And the trainers with some satisfaction say, actually, that's not what we sell, this is what we sell, because that's actually what our customers want. And it's your job to find ever more creative, imaginative, competitive ways of giving our customers what they want. There's a great lesson here in the world of dispute resolution. Because when most people are thinking ahead about dispute resolution, they are, if I might put it this way, of power drill mentality. They tend to think, what do we do today? What processes and systems and, and rules and approaches are in play? And how can we perhaps improve by making things a bit quicker or cheaper or better? Far too seldom do people take the step back and think, actually, what is the value we're bringing here? Why is it? that people involved in the business of dispute resolution are sustained in the market. What benefit do they deliver? What's the hole in the wall of the, the world of dispute resolution? I do not believe, and I do huge amounts of work with a general counsel around the world, for example, they are not passionately committed to the power drill, the, the current way of resolving legal disputes, which is by and large assembling a physical courtroom and there's procedures and processes and there's an independent, independent judge making decisions. They're not committed to that. Their interest, I, I would argue, is, I, is by and large, first of all, to avoid legal disputes in the first place. And secondly, if there is a dispute, to get rid of it as painlessly and as commercially sensible a way as is appropriate to circumstances. They're not committed to the current way of resolving disputes. And I say this always to litigators, because litigators, when they're thinking about their future, I'll stress again, will tend to be a power, power drill mentality. They'll think, well, how can we improve what we're currently doing? The challenge that you're facing, and I think it's far more fundamental, is how can we do it in an entirely different way? With that in mind, I think we should take a step back and think a little bit about technology. And I've been struck 
over the last 10 years by progress with technology. I wrote a book in 1996 called The Future of Law, and it was a 20-year prediction of how legal services might evolve. So last year was quite important for me because it was halfway through. So I had cause to look back over the last 10, and I'm now looking forward to the next 10 and writing another book as a kind of sequel. But in looking back, I saw there has been fantastic progress in, in, in many ways. Uh, in many ways, however, the differences have not gone to the heart of legal services. So electronic mail and BlackBerry machines and so forth have transformed the communication habits of lawyers. Online services, Google and so forth, have transformed the information-seeking habits of lawyers. But has the technology actually penetrated the very heart of legal service and changed, transformed, revolutionized the way that lawyers deliver their services? Well, not quite yet. Uh, my very approximate thesis is that the first 10 years since 1996 very much infrastructural, getting the, the basic technological building blocks in place. And the next 10 years, the 10 years we're about to embark upon, is where we see the real transformations in legal service. And you can look in so many other industries and sectors where the changes have indeed been transformational uh, as a result of technology. But many lawyers I speak to tend to be of the mentality, I think, that I've, I've got my Blackbird machine, I've got Google, and technologically speaking, that's probably it about wrapped up for the legal world. And I'm arguing it's quite the reverse, that we're, we're just warming up. And I, in part, have been influenced by a lot of reading about the growth and development of technology itself. And I recommend you to a book that's about the most remarkable book I've ever read, I think, uh, called The Singularity is Near by a man called Ray Kurzweil. And Kurzweil is a, a, a long-standing, and I think a very well-respected, uh, if fairly extreme, uh, futurist who thinks deeply about the way in which technology will develop. And he says many things in his books, because it's about the many technologies. It's about robotics, genetics, nanotechnology, information technology, all combining. But his theme is that of all of these, they are enjoying and going through exponential growth. So it's not just a steady, uh, modest growth we're seeing development of technology. It's exponential. And he, he points to whether it be uh, the number of internet users, the number of uh, um, transistors in a chip, processing power, hard disk capacity. He points to about 25 different factors, charts and models them, and in all of these areas, he finds this curve, this exponential curve. And his, I think, quite memorable way of putting it is we're at the knee of the curve just now. Uh, so although over the last 10 years, for example, we think the progress in technology has been quite considerable, that's actually the quite shallow part of the curve. We're about to, to use another metaphor of a, in, in popular management culture, we're about to reach the tipping point where we see technology take off in ways that are almost unimaginable. And he captures this so memorably, again, I think, by talking about the average desktop machine. Now, he suggests, and naturally, uh, having done some further research, there's lots of others who have done similar work and support this, he suggests by 2020, the average desktop top machine will have about the same processing power as the human brain. It will be able to perform about 10 to the 16th or 10 to 17 calculations per second. I'm not saying it's intelligent, it's just giving you some sense of the, the processing capability. So that's by 2020. But listen to this. By two days, and how exciting uh, things are in the world of IT more generally. I want to talk about the evolution of legal service. I've been working over the last couple of years in a model that tries to describe, and it's related to technology, but it's not exclusively related to technology, the way in which legal service is evolving. And I haven't completed my thinking this. What I'm trying to do is map ODR onto that model, and I'd welcome your thoughts on that. Penultimately, I want to say, what's the UK government doing? What's happening in this country? And then offer some, some thoughts on the future. But where I want to start, and this is, I, it, it is it, I have used this slide for many, many years, and it applies so well to this area, is a story about Black & Decker, the world's leading manufacturer of power tools. Now, it said that Black & Decker, when they recruit new people, they take their, particularly senior executives, they take them off in a course. And they sit these new executives down in a conference room, and they put up a first slide, and it's a slide much like the slide you see before you, of a gleaming power tool. And they say to the new executives, these people who are part of Black & Decker, they say, this is what we sell, isn't it? And the executives all are rather surprised by this. They say, of course that's what we sell, we're Black & Decker. And the trainers with some satisfaction say, actually, that's not what we sell, this is what we sell, because that's actually what our customers want. And it's your job to find ever more creative, imaginative, competitive ways of giving our customers what they want. There's a great lesson here in the world of dispute resolution. Because when most people are thinking ahead 
of a dispute resolution, they are, if I might put it this way, of power drill mentality. They tend to think, what do we do today? What processes and systems and, and rules and approaches are in play? And how can we perhaps improve by making things a bit quicker or cheaper or better? Far too seldom do people take the step back and think, actually, what is the value we're bringing here? Why is it? that people involved in the business of dispute resolution are sustained in the market. What benefit do they deliver? What's the hole in the wall of the, the world of dispute resolution? I do not believe, and I do huge amounts of work with uh, general counsel around the world, for example, they are not passionately committed to the power drill, the, the current way of resolving legal disputes, which is by and large assembling a physical courtroom and there's procedures and processes and there's an independent, independent judge making decisions. They're not committed to that. Their interest, I, I would argue, is, I, is by and large, first of all, to avoid legal disputes in the first place. And secondly, if there is a dispute, to get rid of it as painlessly and as commercially sensible a way as is appropriate to circumstances. They're not committed to the current way of resolving disputes. And I say this always to litigators, because litigators, when they're thinking about their future, I'll stress again, will tend to be a power, power drill mentality. They'll think, well, how can we improve what we're currently doing? The challenge that you're facing, and I think it's far more fundamental, is how can we do it in an entirely different way? With that in mind, I think we should take a step back and think a little bit about technology. And I've been struck over the last 10 years by progress with technology. I wrote a book in 1996 called The Future of Law, and it was a 20-year prediction of how legal services might evolve. So last year was quite important for me because it was halfway through. So I had cause to look back over the last 10, and I'm now looking forward to the next 10 and writing another book as a kind of sequel. But in looking back, I saw there has been fantastic progress in, in, in many ways. Uh, in many ways, however, the differences have not gone to the heart of legal services. So electronic mail and BlackBerry machines and so forth have transformed the communication habits of lawyers. Online services, Google and so forth, have transformed the information seeking habits of lawyers. But has the technology actually penetrated the very heart of legal service and changed, transformed, revolutionized the way that lawyers deliver their services? Well, not quite yet. Uh, my very approximate thesis is that the first 10 years since 1996 very much infrastructural, getting the, the basic technological building blocks in place. And the next 10 years, the 10 years we're about to embark upon, is where we see the real transformations in legal service. And you can look in so many other industries and sectors where the changes have indeed been transformational uh, as a result of technology. But many lawyers I speak to tend to be of the mentality, I think, that I've, I've got my Blackbird machine, I've got Google, and technologically speaking, that's probably it about wrapped up for the legal world. And I'm arguing it's quite the reverse, that we're, we're just warming up. And I, in part, have been influenced by a lot of reading about the growth and development of technology itself. And I recommend you to a book that's about the most remarkable book I've ever read, I think, uh, called The Singularity is Near by a man called Ray Kurzweil. And Kurzweil is a, a, a long-standing, and I think a very well-respected, uh, if fairly extreme, uh, futurist who thinks deeply about the way in which technology will develop. And he says many things in his books, because it's about the many technologies. It's about robotics, genetics, nanotechnology, information technology, all combining. But his theme is that of all of these, they are enjoying and going through exponential growth. So it's not just a steady, uh, modest growth we're seeing development of technology. It's exponential. And he, he points to whether it be uh, the number of internet users, the number of uh, um, transistors in a chip, processing power, hard disk capacity. He points to about 25 different factors, charts and models them, and in all of these areas, he finds this curve, this exponential curve. And his, I think, quite memorable way of putting it is we're at the knee of the curve just now. Uh, so although over the last 10 years, for example, we think the progress in technology has been quite considerable, that's actually the quite shallow part of the curve. We're about to, to use another metaphor of a, in popular management culture, we're about to reach the tipping point where we see technology take off in ways that are almost unimaginable. And he captures this so memorably, again, I think, by talking about the average desktop machine. Now, he suggests, and naturally, uh, having done some further research, there's lots of others who have done similar work and support this, he suggests by 2020, the average desktop top machine will have about the same processing power as the human brain. It will be able to perform about 10 to the 16th or 10 to 17 calculations per second. I'm not saying it's intelligent, I'm just giving you some sense 
of the, the processing capability. So that's by 2020. But listen to this. By 2050, those who've thought about it have charted uh, progress, and assuming, uh, and I think a, a lot of these assumptions are, are sound, by 2050, the average desktop machine will have more processing power than all of humanity put together. Now, call me old-fashioned, but it seems to me if we can see the day where we can have, on the average desktop machine, more processing power than all of humanity put together, it might be time for lawyers to start rethinking some of the working practices. <laughs> And really, that, that's what you're all about today, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So that's exponential growth. And I, I saw it so vividly. Uh, you have these uh, amazing moments in technology every few years. And I had one about two months ago, maybe a month ago, where I went to uh, introduce one of the, sen the senior partner of one of the Magic Circle firms, that's one of the top five firms in London, to the general counsel of Cisco, who's a very interesting guy, actually. He writes a lot in technology, a man called Mark Chandler. But we went to meet by video conference, and Cisco have recently introduced their next generation of video conference. They call it telepresence. I walked into the room, and I was just absolutely stunned. There was a, on our side, there was a half a table. The three plasma screens completed the table, so it seemed like one round table. And sitting there, larger than life, was Mark at the other end. Now, it wasn't the staccato puppet-like figure in the distance whose face you can barely recognize. There was none of this, the latency, the delay in sound. I kid you not, he was in the room with us. And I, I was absolutely amazed. I really got a shiver up my spine. And it just gave me this insight to what it's going to be like in a few years' time. Video conferencing, as I say, will not be this remote experience. He was in the room. I could look him straight in the eyes. The sound is such that if someone speaks from over there, you hear the sound from over there. The, the interesting reaction uh, from the senior partners, also gobsmacked, was he actually felt he'd met them. There's not a chance on earth with the first generation of video conferencing systems that you feel you've met someone. Uh, in fact, unless you've met them before, it's quite difficult to interact by video conference. This new generation is entirely different. And I thought immediately of dispute resolution. I thought, actually, that could be an arbitrator, a mediator, a judge. It could be the parties. We are in the same room. And the interesting thing is it's only going to get better. It's a reflection of the growth and bandwidth improvements of all sorts of technologies. It's not going to get worse. It's going to get better and rapidly better. So we've got a glimpse there of what we'll all have in all our homes and all our desktop, this ability to bring into the same room anyone in the world. It's utterly unbelievable. And so many people, when they're thinking of technology and they're trying to project ahead, they keep on thinking of the technologies. They're constrained and contained by their current experiences of technology. People somehow need to take a trip into the future. You can go to various labs all around the world, but you only need to look at I also went to see HP, something called their Halo Room. It's very similar, fantastic experience. So that's a, 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 almost a, just one small illustration of the exponential effect. Another big development in technology, and I just want to mention it, it, it for 30 seconds in passing, because it is the biggest one, in my view, is an online community. I've always said the internet's three things. It's global email already in place, global information services, the web is already in place and it's improving, and global community. We're all connected to one another, and of course there's over a billion of us online now. The ability for us to collaborate, to socialize, to commune, to change our relationships is stunning. And we've just seen over the last 18 months, whether it be mass collaboration in the form of Wikipedia, or whether it be social networking in the form of MySpace or Facebook, the take up, the impact, the involvement, the engagement is just fantastic. And in many ways, I see ODR within that context. That it may, uh, ODR is about some kind of social engagement between human beings. Now, when you were talking about it, you've been talking about it for years and years, pre-Facebook, pre-MySpace, uh, pre-Wikipedia, where the idea of communing, collaborating, socializing, engaging together online was rather unheard of. It's quite a hard proposition to sell. It's going to be easier in the future to inject ODR into people's lives because online networking of a social or a working variety is going to become commonplace. So that's the second trend. The third thing to say about technology, of particularly with ODR, is it's disruptive. Now, some of you may have read the book by Clayton Christensen, a great management book called The Innovator's Dilemma. And Christensen's theme is there's two forms of technology, sustaining technology and disruptive technology. Sustaining technologies are technologies that support the way a particular business works or the way a particular sector or industry works. And 
we've seen great improvements through sustaining technology. He argues that the technologies of greatest impact are the disruptive technologies. Technologies that come in, they don't just tweak a little bit at the edges or make some marginal changes at the periphery. These technologies actually fundamentally change the way an organization works, the way an industry functions. And I see ODR in these terms. I, don't, I, I, I see it as a, a fundamental challenge to the way that many litigators work and to the way that many judges work. I don't know many of the techniques of OGR are complementary, but ultimately I think we're, we're moving into a quite diff different paradigm of dispute resolution. So when I'm categorizing ODR, I see it as an instance of, of disruption. I see it as an example of online community, and I see it will only get more and more important as we see the exponential effect of technology. Now, let, let me say a little now, and it will really only be a, a, a very small amount, because I'm thinking my way through this in its application of ODR, about the evolution of legal service. Um, I argue, and, uh, and this is what much of my next book's about, that we're seeing legal service going through five different phases. The bespoke, actually I should, for people who are not English, and certainly for people who are American, I should explain what the word bespoke is, because I've experienced this look in my audience uh, when I use the word bespoke uh, in, in an American context, because apparently you don't use the word there. Uh, bespoke means tailored. We talk about bespoke suits, which are specially made for you, uh, rather than one you just buy off the peg. Uh, or we say bespoke software, where it's developed for you rather than it being off the shelf and shrink-wrapped. So bespoke service is one, and I suppose advocacy in the courtroom is one fantastic example, where the service that's being delivered is finely honed, tailored, uh, geared to the very specific circumstances of the very specific client you have before you, and often the output is lost in the ether, never to be reused. It's a kind of one-off disposable service. But often in legal work, frankly, elements of legal work are routine and repetitive, so we standardize, and we standardize in terms of process. We might use checklists. We standardize in terms of substance. We use standard documents and templates. With the advent of technology, we don't simply uh, keep these processes, these standards, manual. We move on, for example, to workflow systems, uh, or we use automatic document assembly rather than, uh, uh, for example, pulling standard documents out of a lever arch file. Now, if you're within a law firm, all that systematization is very much internal. The next generation is actually where you package and make your knowledge available online. And the final step, and this is a very quick overview, is actually when legal offerings become a commodity, an online freely available commodity, not of no worth, perhaps of very great worth, but not something for, that you're paying for as a bespoke, specific service. And a lot of dispute resolution, of course, my intuition here is, is very much at the bespoke end. Uh, we handle them as their unique disputes, and many law firms, they make their money from handling um, legal disputes in a bespoke manner. And I think I, and what I'm doing is basically challenging that. And, so, and where I see ODR fitting is to the right-hand side. And you, this, actually, is the evolution of court service as well. Can be, uh, there can be a similar model. But I see dispute resolution in terribly simplistic terms uh, involving a space. Now, traditionally, that's a physical space in which we all congregate, but it might be a, a, an electronic, a cyberspace. It involves a process that's subject, usually, to rules of procedure and evidence and, and so forth, and a decision. Now, it seems to me we can look at each of these elements, the space, the process, and decision, and we can ask the question of any particular dispute, do we really need to give this bespoke treatment, or is this sufficiently routine or repetitive of it as it ha happened before in a way we now the standardized, systematized, more packaged and, and commoditized. So it may well be that the, the decision process is highly bespoke, but actually the environment in which one uh, makes that decision might actually be packaged and commoditized, and the process might be systematized. So it's getting that. What I'm not saying is for any particular dispute, you have to say which boxes it fit into. I'm saying I think what we need to do is think about disputes and spread the elements of any particular dispute across that spectrum and make sure of each of space, process, and decision that we're allocating it to the most efficient box. I, I can go on um, ad infinitum about this, but the, the general message is that we are moving away, I think, in the legal world. And my, the clients I advise, uh, particularly general counsel, support this very strong pull to the right-hand side, where it's cheaper, it's more certain, the quality is higher. The idea we need in the, in the spirit of a, the, the, the old crafts people working in a cottage industry to give everything bespoke treatment, I think, uh, I think we'll look upon in the future as rather quaint. So let me, look, let me turn now and ultimately the issue of government, what's actually happening in the UK. I, I, I've been heavily involved, uh, not as, not as uh, 
not for as long as Sir Brian, who I should say publicly has done more to introduce technology to judges in the courts than anyone in the, in, the, in the United Kingdom. But I've been involved for many, many years, and I think hand and heart, overall, it's been a disappointment. Uh, with Lord Wool's IT advised in the civil justice reforms in uh, 1995, and 10 years on, very few of his recommendations in technology in courts have been implemented. I've followed the developments of the CGIT, the criminal justice IT investment, over a billion pounds in the UK, with, frankly, I think, a disappointing uh, results and output. So I can't, at a general level, say, come to you and say, I think in the public sector in the UK there's been some fantastic investments in court technology. There's some exceptions, some tribunals use technology very well, but by and large it's been a disappointment. Uh, um, it doesn't mean many of us aren't continuing to try to, to, to push on, and I think we now have more enlightened civil servants, we have more enlightened politicians. Uh, unfortunately, we have a real money problem in the UK, and uh, the Treasury do not feel that justice technology ranks well against education and health, for example. And that's just the practical problem we face. But the whole question of uh, what about ODR, what's the interest there being? Well, again, um, uh, Brian, so Brian and I were involved in 1999 in a project called Civil.Justice, which seemed like a good name at the time, at the peak of the dot-com era. In retrospect, it was rather naff. But Civil.Justice was looking at the, the long-term implications of the... Uh, of technology for the justice system. And one of the phrases we then used, the questions we posed is, is court a service or a place? And I think in many ways that goes back to the hole in the wall. Uh, I think if you look upon the, uh, the dispute resolution processes about the congregation of human beings in a physical space, that's one model. But actually, we were saying then, uh, uh, if you think from the customers, the clients, the, the person who's, who's, uh, under, uh, who's suffering from some kind of dispute or grievance, think from their point of view, it may well just be more of a service. It's a, it's a process through which they, they, they want to go. So that, the, the government accepted that, and that was formally articulated in this discussion document that there was a discussion at least to be had. So that was encouraging. But the reality ha is, and I think it was mentioned yesterday, if you look at money claim online and possession claim, claim online, go to the court service site in, in the UK see that, these are examples, good examples, of online dispute resolution. Money claim online... Uh, uh, serves the function of a, a county court in relation to uh, um, money claims and is busier than any single county court in the country. Uh, it is a, a fine example, uh, and I, I take my hat off to the government in this respect, of online dispute resolution. Now, I think, and I, I understand the discussion yesterday, people say, oh, you could do A, B, and C, and I'm sure that's true, but actually it's designed, developed, put online, and it's actually working, a dispute resolution system that helps tens of thousands of people every year claim, uh, make money claims without enduring the difficulties of assembling and the, uh, uh, assembling in a courtroom. Uh, so that's impressive. But I think by and large, if you're asking what investment the UK government's making or, um, in courtroom technology, you'll see is far more investment in the whole area of electronic disclosure, which is uh, uh, loosely related but a different subject altogether. That's the focal point. It's, uh, um, Online dispute resolution is not a strategic priority, but I think you will, you'll probably see more systems of money claim online rolling out, but maybe not as rapidly as many of us would want. I also have the good fortune to be co-chair with Lord Newberger of a body called ITAC, and this was actually a body that, uh, that again, Sir Brian helped set up in the mid-80s with the Lord Chancellor, which is a body that exists, Information Technology and Courts Committee, to encourage all bodies in the UK who are involved uh, in dispute resolution to exchange information with one another about their use of technology. And it used to be we physically congregated together for these meetings, but what we're currently developing is taking longer than we'd want, where we're currently developing a public website where you can simply go online and find out what any court's doing in technology, and under 25 headings we've identified, identify, for example, electronic disclosure, you can, you can see which courts are actually using that technology. There's a kind of matrix. And we hope to put that online as a UK resource and maybe expand it more generally. And that's got the full support of government, and indeed they're, 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 they're funding that. So that's encouraging. The final thing I'm involved with, in the sense that I'd love your input, uh, uh, I, I'm uh, advising on the technology that's to be put in place for the new Supreme Court that's going to be set up in, in England, uh, or in the United Kingdom. And um, we're thinking through uh, how, what technologies should be in place. So that it won't uh, uh, be up and running the court until 2009, but of course the world will be a different place in two years' time. But we're also thinking uh, we want the technologies to be, to, to be able to last a few years. And I'm not sure the scope, what the scope might be for ODR 
uh, in the Supreme Court, you may say, and I, I, it's my, my gut reaction is, if ever there's a need for a, a bespoke court service, it's at the level of the Supreme Court. But if any of you have got ideas, please do email me on how you think uh, technology, in particular ODR, might be used in the new Supreme Court. So overall, I think some, some pockets of excellence, but I cannot claim that ODR is a strategic priority. Uh, so that leads me really finally just to, to offer some thoughts, because it's really to offer some thoughts to you, a community of people who are interested in an emerging field of legal technology. And as I said at the beginning, it resonates with me because over the years I've been involved with technology, particularly in the 80s, when I was involved with the artificial intelligence and legal reasoning community, there was a similar number of people terribly enthused, struggling a little to get the profession engaged, struggling a little to get government funding, struggling a little to be taken seriously in the academic world beyond a few uh, centers of excellence. And some thoughts that spring to mind in relation to that. And the first thought is for ODR to take hold you run the risk of becoming too techy. I wasn't at yesterday's session, but I've had a look at some of the papers and I've heard the discussions. And of course, that's absolutely appropriate for an event like this. But actually, there's a sense, I certainly know with senior policymakers in government and senior partners in law firms, uh, there's still a fear of technology. And if this looks like a, a high-tech, um, rather formidable high-tech area to them, you'll scare them off. And there's also the sense, there's a great book written, or sorry, a great title of a book called The Inmates Are Running the Asylum. And there's a sense in which if, if it looks as if technologists are driving, or people who are fascinated by technologists, technology are driving ODR, that weakens its plausibility. You actually need for this field lots of unlikely champions. You need senior judges, senior academics, you need senior lawyers, of whom it would be said, gosh, if they're taking it seriously, this must really be important. In a sense, everyone who comes here uh, by selecting yourselves to come here, you're almost disqualified from being an unlikely champion. And I, I look back in the 80s and I see with artificial intelligence law, it held so much potential, but it became incredibly introspective and actually stayed at the periphery. This is the potential to become mainstream, but you can't do it on your own. So you need to in some way engage people who are mainstream and of whom it would be said, I'm surprised they're supporting it. This must be taken more seriously. So that was my first thought. Second thought was there's two misconceptions to, to dispel. Uh, the first one, uh, and I think, uh, I think Brian mentioned this yesterday in his speech, um, it's not that, it, most people think of ODR, I think, well, there's a good way of resolving disputes that have arisen in the internet. And of course, it is a good way of resolving disputes that have arisen in the internet. But my interest in this is, I see it as a fantastic way of plugging in across the life cycle of a, of a legal service I mentioned, of plugging in uh, new methods of dispute resolution for conventional disputes. But most people, if you ask them about ODR, who are untutored in the subject, will, if they know anything about it, or if they've heard of it, will tend to think this is the technique that's used to resolve disputes on eBay. And of course, I, that, that's of course terribly relevant, but I see its potential as far greater than that. And I know you do too, but there's a misconception out there. And there's a second one I find as I travel about, yes, it's okay for small claims, uh, uh, money claim online and so forth, but you get a really big dispute. I can't really see its potential. But I, I, again, I'll go back to people at the General Council of the United States. These people, many organizations, their spend, the legal spend of dispute resolution stretches into billions of dollars. They are desperate to find new ways of resolving disputes. And I don't think there's any reason, because the structure and nature of the dispute, it, it doesn't really vary um, often uh, according to what the size of the claim. You have a very complex dispute where the amount of issue is small. You can very, from a legal point of view, very straightforward dispute where the amount is vast. I don't think any simple mapping of ODR, small disputes, uh, conventional litigation, arbitration, ADR, major dispute. I don't think that's how we should look at it. So the, how we could transform the world of ODR is by using this technology on a handful of major disputes. And I think that's a great challenge for you all. Uh, I also think we need, uh, certainly in the UK and more generally, probably what I, I advised this, I was involved in something called the Tribunal Review in 2000, where we looked at uh, all the tribunals up and down in England and Wales. And I had the thought then that we could do the front end uh, to all our dispute resolution mechanisms and facilities in the, in the UK at least, for the average citizen who knows nothing about the law or legal processes or dispute resolution, the, the wealth and profusion of courts and tribunals and ombudsmen and all the rest of it, simply to know what first step you should take 
is it self permittable and I had in mind this uh, online and may have been done in other jurisdictions um, front end where if you have a grievance and I use that as a fairly generic term one would be asked a series of questions and select a few items from menu and you would be orientated and say on the face of it given the nature of your grievance there are two or three possible avenues you should perhaps explore but actually for many people uh, um, and I call this a huge latent market, who really need legal help and would benefit from it, they don't actually get past first base because they don't actually know where to go, what body, what service, what system could help them resolve their dispute. So a very simple thing we can do online is actually is that, that primer. Now, penultimately, uh, and this is a, another lesson I've been uh, expressing for many years, it's that, that we should look upon OTR technology as an example of what I call innovation rather than automation. Automation of technology is what most people think of when they, they think of computer systems. They, take a, they think of taking some kind of process or activity or organization and applying technology to it, to systematize it, to, to streamline it, to motorize, all these kinds of words one hears. But the fundamental idea of automation is the process exists. Let's use technology to improve that process. And a lot of investment in dispute resolution technology has been of that sort. The whole litigation support area has been nothing to do with changing the nature of litigation, it's about making existing litigation or litigation processes more effective through using technology. Now I see ODR as a gap of innovation. In my, in my terms, at least, I define innovation technology as when you use, you use technology to do things that previously weren't possible or perhaps even imaginable. Now yeah, I've just seen that Cisco video conference experience, you can see actually suddenly you genuinely can convene in a virtual space and it is today, it's just about as good as a real meeting. In five or ten years' time, the, they'll almost be indistinguishable. In fact, in some ways, it might even be uh, uh, surreal, even, even more real that, that assembly together. That's an example of innovation. Uh, ten or fifteen years ago, or two years ago, it wasn't possible to, to do this. So many people say to me, of course, that there's no such thing as uh, innovation through technology. Uh, and I always put this challenge out to them of that technology. One of the most, the ATM, the, the cash dispenser, one of the most successful information technologies of our world, actually, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and beyond. Um, now, if you have an automation mindset, that's to say, if you think technology simply automates pre-existing processes and can't give rise to innovation, if you have that mindset, I always say, well, what process did that automate? Was it the case that 30 years ago, in the middle of the night, we needed money, you went down to the local bank, there was some poor soul sitting there, and you bent down, hand-clutching fibers came out, and you said, thank you very much. It wasn't that that process existed, and some bankers got round the table and said, come on, chaps, this is rather inefficient and often quite chilly. Why don't we do it a different way? Of course not. It was the information technology gave rise to a fundamentally new way of delivering the domestic banking service. And it's the same in dispute resolution. The challenge is to innovate in technology, not simply to automate pre-existing and often inefficient and inappropriate processes. The challenge is to use technology to create an entirely new way, it seems to me, of providing dispute resolution services. And finally, uh, and this is fundamental in many ways, the more I speak to clients of law firms and clients of lawyers rather than judges, rather than academics, uh, rather than law firms, the hole in the wall, to use my earlier metaphor, is nothing to do with dispute resolution. And I hinted at it. It's about dispute avoidance. That actually, I have not yet met a client who says, what I really want is a really big dispute very well resolved. That's not what they're after. They want to avoid dispute altogether. And I've used this slide for many, many years as well. This captures what for most clients law is all about. It's about legal risk management. They want a fence at the top of the cliff rather than an ambulance at the bottom. And the danger with so much use of technology in dispute resolution is what it's doing is it's providing uh, a more powerful ambulance, a better equipped ambulance, an ambulance that gets to the scene of the, tr the crime perhaps quicker, but actually, fundamentally, that's not what clients are after. Clients want a fence at the top of the cliff. And I'm wondering, when I think of ODR, the extent, the role it can have in this preventative uh, legal medicine, as it were, whether or not there are techniques we can put in place which are complementary to those that you've been discussing uh, over the last day or so, where the challenge is actually to use systems to build that fence to help clients avoid problems rather than to uh, resolve them more effectively. And I want to leave you with that challenge. Thank you very much for inviting me to be involved. I'll say no more. Thank you.